بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه إن شاء الله we will pick up where we left off we are uh, now in section 25 which will be the last section in this chapter this is the hadith of Imam Hassan from Ibn Abi Hala on the Prophet's qualities sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so this is the hadith of uh, which is considered one of the most detailed hadith that we have that describes the physical features of the Prophet Sallallahu his hilya as we call it. And he ends this section or this chapter with this hadith as it is a concluding piece that discusses everything about the Prophet Sallallahu Is there a sound problem? Somebody said there's no sound? Okay, so. Yeah, there is no sound. Volume is low, very low. Okay, one person says the sound is fine. Should the far me also sound is not good. Okay. قال المصنف رحمه الله ونفعنا بعلومه في الدارين آمين الإمام قاضي عياد رحمه الله He says, may Allah bless him and may we have, may we benefit from his works in this life and in the next. Section 25, the hadith of Al-Hasan from Ibn Abi Hala on the Prophet's qualities, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he says, we have told you about some of his praiseworthy qualities, glorious virtues and attributes of perfection. We have shown you that he truly had them and, he, and we have presented ample traditions to support this. The matter itself is far more extensive. So although this chapter about his him ranges wide, we have hardly even begun to exhaust all of the proofs. The ocean of the knowledge of his qualities is overflowing. Bucketfuls drawn from it have a negligible effect upon it. So he's, of course, the, the greatness of the Prophet is, is endless. So he says, however, we think that we should finish this section with Hassan's hadith from Ibn Abi Hala since it covers so many of the qualities and includes quite a lot of his biological, biographical detail. Al-Hasan ibn Ali. So this is Hassan, the son of Imam Ali, alayhi salam. He said, I asked my uncle Hind ibn Abi Hala, radiallahu anhu, who was Sayyidah Khadija's, uh, a relative of Sayyidah Khadija, about the features of the messenger of Allah, sallam, since he was wont to describe them. Kana was Safan in the area. He was a person that used to describe and characterize things. So that was a feature that some some people have is that they are uh, they can give vivid descriptions. I wanted him to describe them to me so that I could retain them in my mind. So he said, the messenger of Allah وسلم, was imposing and majestic. His face shone like a full moon. He was somewhat taller than medium height and a little shorter than what could be described as tall. He was like the full moon, you know, in the middle of the middle of the uh, lunar months, in the middle nights. It's dark out, outside, but then the full moon radiates every, it's like the lights are on. Right? He said the Prophet was like that. He was like a light. And even though he was average height, he still seemed to be the most majestic and the tallest of the people when he was in their presence. His head was large and he had hair that was neither curly nor straight. It was parted and did not go beyond the lobes of his ears. Now we have, you know, the, the lobes, you know, like this, but then there are other hadith that the the hair of the Prophet ﷺ was lower. And all of this is really a function of someone cutting their hair, whether for Hajj or Umrah, shaving it and growing back, things like that. He was very fair skinned with a wide brow. He had thick eyebrows with a narrow space between them. He had a vein. So he had a vein in the middle of his, you know, between his eyebrows which throbbed when he was angry. He had a long nose with a line of light cover, uh, with a line of light over 
in which someone might unthinkably take to be his nose. His beard was thick. He had black eyes, firm cheeks, a wide mouth, and white teeth with gaps. The fair hair of his chest formed a fine line, meaning from the middle of his chest all the way down, a fine line, with a light over it, which someone might unthinkably take to be his nose. Afwan. The hair of his chest formed a fine line. His neck was like that of a statue made of pure silver. His physique was finely balanced. His body was firm and full. His belly and chest were equal in size. So he was not overweight or underweight, but the perfect size. His chest was broad and the space between his shoulders was wide. He had full calves. He was luminous. Between his neck and his navel, there was a line of hair, but the rest of his torso was free of it. He had hair on his forearms and shoulders and the upper part of his chest. He had thick wrists, wide palms, rough hands and feet. His fingers were long. He was fine sinewed. He had high insteps and his feet were so smooth that water ran off of them. When he walked, he walked as though he were going down a hill, you know, so slightly kind of like leaning forward. He walked in a dignified manner and walked easily. He walked swiftly. When he walked, it was as though he were heading down a slope. When he turned to address someone, he turned his whole body completely. You know, so if somebody came like from the side here, usually we would just go like this and talk to them. But rather what the Prophet Sassan would do is he would go like this and he would face the person and talk to them. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He lowered his glance, glancing downwards more than upwards. He restrained his glance. He spoke first to his companions and was the first to greet any person that he met. Okay. So the Prophet Sassan was modest and you know he wasn't just kind of like always looking around and you know, but very pensive, controlling his glance, etc. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then Al-Hasan asked, tell me how he spoke. Ibn Abi Hadi re replied, the messenger of Allah Sallallahu was always subject to grief and was always reflective. Not grief as if, as if he was depressed, but would err on the side of remembering the gravity on the reality of life and the hereafter. He had no rest and he only spoke when it was necessary. He spent long periods in silence. He began and ended what he said correctly. His words were comprehensive without being either superfluous or wordy or inadequate. So he was what we call eloquent, fasih in Arabic, meaning that he used the right amount of words to convey what needed to be conveyed, no more and no less. And that's actually a very difficult, um, that's a difficult task because it requires not only a mastery of language, but it requires clear thinking so that you can convey the thought that you have in the right amount of words. So it requires both of those, of those things. He had a mild temperament, being neither harsh nor cruel. He valued a gift, even if it was small. He did not censure anything nor criticize or praise the taste of food. So this is the part of the hadith that I used uh, maybe in the last few khutbahs I gave at ICCP um, about how he would enlarge and ennoble and engrandize any type of gift or blessing that was given to him. He did not get angry because of it, about the food that is. He did not attend to securing his own due, nor did he get angry for himself, nor help himself. 
So even though the Prophet ﷺ was subject to great criticism, he never took retribution for anything that happened to his personal self. When he pointed, he did so with his whole hand. So you know he wouldn't point like like that, you know, like that over there. But he would point with his whole hand. When he was surprised about something, he turned his palm upside down. When he talked, he held his right thumb in his left palm, like this. When he was angry, he turned away and averted his face, which means that he was in control of his anger. So he didn't let the anger, because anger is a, a normal uh, feeling that we have, an emotion. It's, it's not bad that you get angry. What's, what's bad and what's wrong is that you act on your anger. So here the Prophet would turn away, so he was able to hold his anger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he was happy, he looked downwards. Generally, his laughter consisted of a smile and he showed his teeth, which were as white as hailstones. So there are some hadith in which the Prophet وسلم, laughed so, so hard, ah, you know, like that, that you saw his wisdom teeth. Few hadith. And one of the ulama uh, compiled them all in a little uh, treatise. But the majority of his laughter was in the form of smiling. Sallallahu alayhi wa al Hasan said, I refrained from mentioning this to al Hussein, his brother, for a while. Then I spoke to him and found that he had beaten me to it. He had asked our father about how the Messenger of Allah Sassan behaved at home. And when he was out and about his features, he had not omitted anything. Al Hussein said, I asked my father, meaning Imam Ali salam, about how the Messenger of Allah Sassan was at home. He said, it was allowed him to enter his house for his own comfort. When he retired to his house, he divided his time into three parts. One for Allah, one for the family, and one for himself. Then he divided his part between his people and himself. So he had, you know, self time, alone time, but not that much. Because the majority of his time was dedicated towards other people. He used the time for the people more for the common people than for the elite. He did not reserve anything for himself to their exclusion. Of his conduct in the part reserved for himself was that he, I lost my place, one second. Of his conduct in the part reserved for himself was that he would show preference to the people of merit and would divide the time according to their excellence in the deen. Some people needed one thing, some people needed two, some people had many needs. He concerned himself with them and kept them busy doing things that were good for them and the community. He always asked about them and what was happening to them. He used to say, those who are present should convey things to those who are Aren't absent. You going? And you should He's let down. me know about what is needed by people who cannot convey their needs to me. On the day of rising, Allah will make firm the feet of a person who conveys to a ruler the need of someone who cannot convey it to himself. This was all that was mentioned in his presence, and he would only accept this from people. Then the hadith of Sufyan ibn Waqiya says, they entered as seekers and only parted after having ta tasted something. That means a man of fiqh. Now come back. Al Hussein said, Tell me about when he went out and how he behaved then. His father replied, The Messenger of Allah وسلم, held his tongue except regarding what, pe what concerned people. He brought people together and did not split them. Right? That's a very important description. He brought people together and did not split them. So you know, the whole thing, this whole thing of ours is that we bring each other together, that we bring people together. We're a community, right? I don't understand why some people, they take the deen and they use that deen to split people. 
You know, this we're meant to bring people together. So to bring people together, think about that. It requires compromise. It requires forgiveness. It requires tolerance. It requires mercy. It requires love. Fundamentally, love. If you don't love people, you're not going to be able to bring them together. So this is the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu The Sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, is to bring people together. So when you find community, right, especially a community, mashallah, like our, we're so blessed with this community to have this diversity. This is a sign of of the you know the living Sunnah of the of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi He brought people together and he did not split them. He honored the nobles of every group of people and appointed them over their people. So when the Prophet ﷺ would find that there were natural leaders, group leaders or, you know, um, people that had a following, people of influence, he acknowledged that, you know, Allah wanted that to happen. So he would let them continue having that influence uh, and that prominence amongst their people. He was cautious about people and on his guard against them, but he did what he but he did that without averting his face from them or being discourteous. So he was socially engaged, even though you know he would protect himself from the machinations or whatever of the fitna that might occur trials and tribulations of social life, but he was socially engaged. He was not recluse. He asked about his companions and he asked people how other people were. You know, so he'd show up at the mosque. And, oh, where's so-and-so? Is he okay? I haven't seen him like the last two days. He would ask people about other people. He praised what was good and encouraged it and disliked what was ugly and discouraged it. So that's a criteria that we have in the Sharia, that things that are good, we encourage, whatever the shape and form it might be. And if something is the opposite, we also warn against it. We say, that's not a good habit. That's not a good thing. He took a balanced course without making changes. He was not negligent, fearing that people would be negligent or weary. He was prepared for any eventuality. He did not neglect a right, nor did he let his debts reach the point where others had to pay him, uh, had to help him. The best and most preferred people in his eyes were those who had good counsel for all. Those he most esteemed were those who supported and helped him. And Hussein then asked him about his assembly and how he behaved in it. So he said, the Messenger of Allah Sassam, did not sit down or stand up without mentioning Allah. He did not reserve a special place for himself and forbade other people to do so. And so he didn't have a throne room or a throne or a special chair. He just, he walked in and he sat wherever he sat, that kind of situation. When he came to people, he sat down at the edge of the assembly and told the people to do the same. So if he if he walked in, he just sat. He didn't, you know, step over everybody to get to the front or the center or something like that. He uh, he gave everyone who sat with him his share, so that no one who sat with him thought that anyone was honored more than he was. So if you were in his presence, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you would think that you were the most important person in the world. If anyone sat with him or stood near him to ask for something. He put up with that person until the person turned away. When someone asked him for something he needed, he either departed with it or with some counseling words. He had the kindness and best behavior of all people being like a father to them. They were all equal in respect of their rights with him. His assembly was one of forbearance, modesty, patience, trust. His voices were not raised in it, nor were shortcomings made public nor lapses exposed. So the Prophet ﷺ never humiliated anyone, exposed somebody. You know, there, there was not, in, in Medina, there was not this cancel culture. Its members were attached to each other by fear of Allah and they were humbled. The old were respected and mercy was shown to them, to the young, 
They helped those with needs and showed mercy to strangers. Al Hussein then asked about how the Messenger of Allah وسلم, behaved with his companions. So Imam Ali وسلم, said the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was always cheerful, easy tempered, mild. He was neither rough nor coarse. He did not shout nor utter obscenities. He did not find fault with nor overpraise people. He ignored what was superfluous and left it. So everyone has their idiosyncrasies, right? So he didn't make a big deal about it. He just accepted and tolerated those. He abandoned three things in himself, hypocrisy, storing things up, and what did not concern him, right? So the Prophet Sallallahu you know, obviously, was, <laughs> he was the furthest away from hypocrisy. So he did what he said, and he said what he did. He wouldn't hoard things, overly, you know, mass things and acquire things. And he did not concern, and he stayed away from things that did not concern him. Oh, how much trouble we give ourselves by concerning ourselves with things that are not none of our business, right? The Prophet Sallallahu he had none of that. that. It's so heavy when you concern yourself or they call it, what do they call it? The tea, you know, you, the gossip. Oh, really? And you just, you like dive into people's problems and then you forget dealing with your own problems. He, he also abandoned three things in respect of other people. He did not censure anyone. He did not scold them, nor try to find out their secrets. This is so important because this is almost the exact opposite of modern culture. So he did not censure anyone. You know, people make mistakes. Unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed a verse or two or three regarding somebody's situation, which, you know, happened at times. But, you know, he would just correct them or tell them that's wrong or something. But, you know, he didn't X them out and, and publicly humiliate them. So he didn't censure them. And he didn't scold them. Um, he didn't yell at them. If they somebody messed up, you know, it was very clear that they messed up because he would just be silent. He wouldn't respond to them. And that silence was, you know, killing. There are many hadith in which the companions would come and, you know, someone would like, I think there's a hadith in which Omar radiallahu anhu came to ask the Prophet Sassam a question. And then he was silent. So Omar asked him a second time and he was silent. And then Omar asked him a third time and the Prophet Sassam was silent. And Omar is like, I wished I had never been born or asked the, that, that silence killed him. You know, the Prophet Sassam didn't turn around and yell and he's like, leave me alone, I'm too busy. He didn't do that. Just, you know, I, I'm not going to answer that question right now or something like that. And then he says, he did not try to find out their secrets. Spying. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, do not spy on each other. I had a guy, he came into me once <laughs> with his wife. And he was trying to justify, you know, his spying on his wife. Uh, I said, Akhi, this was here in Egypt. So I said, Akhi, you can't do that. You can't, how can you? He's open about it. You know, and he hacked her phone with the cell phone company. I mean, it was so ridiculous. I was like, Akhi, you can't do that. And he got, he came to me thinking, you know, without a shadow of a doubt that I was going to support everything that he said. And he was, you know, very surprised when he found out it was the exact opposite. I said, this is haram. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, it's a, it's a major sin to spy. And then he started, he, he gave me this hadith about spying at the time of warfare. I was like, and you're comparing your marriage to warfare? I was like, what's wrong with you? I think, listen to what, he was not happy when he left. But you know, <laughs> the truth is the truth. You can't find out people's secrets because we all have secrets. Now, you don't know what I was doing five minutes before we started this class. I mean, obviously I was sleeping, but, but you, I mean, you don't know where I was, who I was talking with, just like I don't know where you were five minutes before the class started. We all, Allah Ta'ala has made certain things, has concealed certain things of our lives from one another. So, which means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has determined that certain things should be private 
and certain things should be pri uh, public. Uh, and when something happens that's private, you have, as believers, we have to understand that that means Allah wants it to be private. So therefore, I have no right to go look into people's homes, to stalk them, to spy on them, etc. You have to just let people be, just like you want people to leave you. So that's an important quality. He only spoke about things for which he expected a reward from Allah Ta'ala. When he spoke, the people sitting with him were as still if there were birds on their heads. When he was silent, they talked, but did not quarrel in his presence. When someone talked in front of him, they kept quiet until he had finished. Their conversation was about the first topic broached. He laughed at what they laughed at and was surprised at what surprised them. He was patient with a stranger who had coarse language. So the thing about laughing with the pe people, etc., the Prophet you know, he, he, he just talked about what people talked about. So if he came upon the companions and they were talking about, I don't know, something that happened in the, the marketplace today or, or, or some, you know, some, someone's telling a story from when they were a child. Or so we, oh, the Prophet Sassam engaged uh, in that conversation. And then he was patient with somebody who had coarse language. So the Bedouin Arabs are known to be coarse people, rough and tough kind of people, you know, not refined city dwellers. I mean, as the case with anybody that's not used to social interactions. So he was patient with them. He tolerated that. And some of them were just downright rude and would say very rude things to him. But not necessarily out of rudeness, but just that's their nature. So the Prophet didn't take offense to that. He said, when you find someone asking something he needs, then give it to him. He did not look for praise except to counterbalance something. He did not interrupt anyone speaking until that person had himself come to an end by either speaking or getting up from when he was sitting. So this entire thing that we just read, this, this is the end of the hadith of Sufyan ibn Waqiyah, sorry, this last part. Someone else asked Imam Adi what the silence of the Messenger of Allah was like. So he said he was silent for four reasons, for forbearance, caution, appraisal, and reflection. His appraisal lay in constantly observing and listening to people. His reflection was upon what would endure and what would vanish. His forbearance and his patience and nothing provocative angered him. He was cautious about four things in adopting something good, which would be followed, in abandoning something bad, which would be abandoned, in striving to determine what would be beneficial for his community, and in establishing for them what would combine the business of this world and the next. This, with Allah's praise and help, brings to a closure our description of him. Okay, so now we begin chapter three. Now this section, the first section of chapter three is quite long. We will not get through it all. So just flagging that. Okay, so he says, Rahimahullah, on the sound and well-known traditions related about the immense value placed on him by his Lord, his exalted position, and his nobility in this world and the next. There is no disputing that he was the noblest of mankind, the master of the children of Adam, which is how he described himself, وسلم, the person with the highest position in the eyes of Allah, the highest rank, and the nearest to him. Know that the hadiths which have been reported regarding this are numerous. We have confined ourselves to those which are sound and well known, and we have devoted 12 sections to discussing them and their meaning. So this chapter will have these 12 sections in which we're going to talk about his greatness, exalted status, etc. Section 1. What has come concerning his place with his Lord, the mighty and majestic, his being chosen, his high renown, his being preferred, his mastery over the children of Adam, the prerogative of the ranks he was given in this world, and the blessing of his excellent name. 
صلى الله عليه وسلم. Ibn Abbas رضي الله عنه said that the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said, Allah divided people into two groups and he put me in the best of the groups. Allah talks of the companions of the right, أصحابو اليمين وأصحابو الشمال, the companions of the right and the companions of the left. I am amongst the companions of the right and I am the best of the companions of the right. Then he divided the two groups into three and he put me in the best of three. He says the companions of the right and the companions of the left and the outstrippers, the outstrippers was سابقون سابقون. I am amongst the outstrippers and I am the best of the outstrippers. Then he divided the three into tribes and he put me in the best of tribes. Allah Ta'ala says, we have appointed you races and tribes so that you may know one another. Indeed, the noblest amongst you is the God-fearing. Allah is all-knowing and all-aware. That verse. I am the most God-fearing of the sons of Adams and the noblest in the sights of Allah Ta'ala. And I am not boasting. Then he divided the tribes and put me in the best of house. And he says, Allah Ta'ala only desires to remove impurity from you, people of the house, and to purify you. Right, so this hadith, it's a well-known hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu is talking about how Allah Ta'ala, in his creation of humanity, there are just naturally divisions amongst people. There are good people and there are bad people. It's as simple as that. The Prophet Sallallahu is amongst the good people. And in the good people, there's the good, you know, the great and the best. He is from the best. And amongst the best, he divided them and scattered them in different tribes, etc. So he is... He has been placed in the best of places, the best of lineage, the best of tribes, the best of family, etc. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And, you know, we don't have aristocracy in Islam or theocracy, but this is as close to that as it gets from the point of view is that the, the people of Quraysh and the, the house of Hashim, they were chosen to carry the noble lineage of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. And, you know, you will find when you read in early Islamic history, for example, that the people of Quraysh were considered noble, such that if somebody from Quraysh did something wrong, the other people of the community would be like, yeah, yeah, and you're from Quraysh. You know, how can you act like that? You know, you meaning that you are descended from this type of nobility. Abu Salama said that Abu Huraira said that they asked the Messenger of Allah, Sassam, when was prophethood decreed? For you, and he said, when Adam was between body and spirit. So, this is a very important hadith because it brings up a theological point that oftentimes we forget, which is that the Prophet وسلم, was the first of people in creation in a realm other than this realm, in a world other than this world, in a time other than this time, of course. But the Prophet ﷺ was created, the reality of the Prophet ﷺ was created. In, in the literature of Tasawwuf, we, we refer to it as the light of the Prophet, Nur and Nabi Wasallam, Because there are many traditions in which the Prophet ﷺ was created first as a light. And the light made uh, invocations in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, for X number of years, thousands of years. And then that light was taken and placed in the progeny of Adam alayhi salam. Now, the strength of those traditions is not necessarily important because the theological point is sound, which is that the Prophet وسلم, because this hadith is sound, when they said, when were you a prophet? And he said, when Adam, uh, how did she translate it? Was between body and spirit. I mean, Adam was just being created but before the creation of Adam was the creation of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now that's sound. So we refer to him therefore as the first in creation and the last to be sent to humanity in the earthly sense sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now that's a pretty big deal. That's a big statement. Okay. So remember that because that's important. Wa uh, ila ibn al. Asqa reported that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, Allah chose Ismail 
from the people, children of Abraham. And then he chose Bani Kanana from the children of Ismail. He chose Quraysh from Bani Kanana. He chose Banu Hashim from Quraysh. And then he chose me from Banu Hashim. Another well-known hadith about the lineage of the Prophet Isa Salaam. In the hadith of, so the Prophet Salaam, by the way, just so we remember, is a descendant of Ismail, alayhi salam. So most or all, all, yeah, all of the Hebrew prophets, the, the, the Jewish prophets, are descendants from Isaac, Ishaq, alayhi salam. Even from that lineage would come Christ, alayhi salam. But from the descendants of Ismail comes Sayyidina Muhammad alayhi salatu salam. And there's a verse in the uh, book of Genesis that refers to this um, something along the lines, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but when Abraham left Ismail, Ishmael, uh, and Hajar in, in the valley of Becca, as it's referred to in the, in the Hebrew Bible, that and you know and from his descendants will come a great nation or something to that effect so that's even a verse in the book of genesis by the way okay in the hadith of Enes, the prophet said i am the most honored of the children of adam with my lord and it is no boast meaning that he's not saying this to show off but this is a reality this is a fact then there is what is reported in the hadith of ibn abbas I am the noblest of, of the first and the last, and it is no boast. Aisha reported that the Prophet ﷺ said, Jibreel السلام, came to me and said, I have searched the east and west of the earth, and I saw no man better than Muhammad, وسلم, and I saw no clan better than Banu Hashim. Anna said that the Burak was brought to the Prophet ﷺ on the night journey. It shied away from him. And Jibreel said to it, would you do this to Muhammad? No one has ever ridden you who is more honored with Allah than he. At, at that, the Burak began to sweat. Now the Burak, we know, is the special riding animal that is exclusive to the Prophets, alayhi salam. And the Burak, because the distance of time between the Anbiya is, is so great, some of the ulama would say that the last time the Burak was used was at the time of Ibrahim السلام, when he was traveling uh, down to Mecca to visit Ismail السلام. So this is why the Burak was feisty. You know, it, it's, it's sort of not been ridden in a while, etc. Ibn Abbas reported that the Prophet ﷺ said, when Allah created Adam, he made me descend to the earth in his loins. Okay, this goes back to what I was saying a minute ago about our theological belief. He put me in the loins of Nuh in the ark, cast me into the fire in the loins of Ibrahim. Then he continued to move me from noble loins to pure wombs until he brought me out for my parents. None of them ever met in fornication. So now the hopefully the concept is becoming more full about how the Prophet was created first and then that was that you know genetic material was placed inside the composition and creation of Adam السلام, and then passed from generation to generation. This is what Al Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib was indicating when he said, and this is a few lines of poetry, that the Prophet's uncle, Al Abbas, composed Before you came into this world, you were excellent in the shadows and in the repository in the time of Adam, when they covered themselves with leaves, then you fell through the ages, not as a mortal, nor a lump of flesh, nor as a clot. Rather is a drop which rode the ships and put a bridle on the idol Nasr while its people were drowned in the time of Nuh. The drop was transferred from the loin to womb as the world proceeded, the next era appeared, 
Then your guardian house contained loftiness from Khindif underneath which were mountain ranges. When you were born, the earth shone and the horizons was illuminated by your light. We travel in that illumination and in the light of the and the paths of the right guidance. O coolness of the fire of Ibrahim, O cause of the protection in the blazing fire. So I mean, it's quite beautiful. I mean, the, those lines of poetry by Al Abbas. But Al Abbas, the point of um, the point of the lines of the poetry is to show that Al Abbas, who was you know, one of the great companions of the Prophet Sallallahu understood what we were talking about as, you know, some very central uh, fundamental thing. I just wanted to look that something up from those verses. Abu Dhar ibn Umar ibn Abbas, Abu Huraira, and Jabir ibn Abdullah, they all relate that the Prophet ﷺ said, I have been given five things which no prophet before me was given. I was helped by terror being cast in the hearts of my enemies a month in advance of my arrival. So one of his special traits is that the Prophet ﷺ was given victory by fear, which means this is actually a sign of mercy because there were many military engagements in which the Prophet ﷺ did not have to actually fight and shed blood because people were scared. So when you read this on face value, people think that this means that, you know, he terrorized people, you know, uh, in their hearts. And that's not what it means. It means that he didn't have to fight many of the battles because the people ended up becoming scared to fight with him. I saw some which was a mercy for those people. And then he says, the earth has been made a mosque for me and a place of purity so that when the time of prayer comes, any man of, or woman of my community can pray. So as we know, and as, as we're familiar with, we pray anywhere and at any time. So, that we, you know, you could write a, little comic book on all the funny places Muslims pray or have prayed. So we have the the earth is one big message for us. That doesn't mean that we're not going to support our mosque, right? We're still going to support our mosque, but we have the flexibility. And then he said the spoils which were not made lawful to any prophet before me have been made lawful for me. So the spoils of war, uh, which is a huge uh, a, a huge thing that caused the expansion of the early Muslim community. I mean, the early Muslim civilization was only built by that massive, or one of the tools that built it was that massive influx of the income that came from the spoils of war. And I have been sent to all people. So all of the other prophets were sent to their specific people. Whereas the Prophet is the only universal Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, and I have been given intercession for all of humanity, as we know. Another version includes, ask and you will be given, and yet another version, my community will be presented before me, and I will have no fear about what can come to be followed from the following. Another version has, I was sent to the red and the black. It is said that the black are the Arabs and the red are the foreigners. It is also said that the red are men and the black are the jinn. So, you know, Arabs tend to have a more darker complexion. And red is a reference to non-Arabs. It's not, it's just usage. It's not, I mean, obviously people are not red, but it's just a usage in the Arabic language. Sometimes these things don't translate. That might be one instance. In another, had, uh, another hadith reported from Abu Huraira, uh, the, the Prophet said, I have been helped by terror being cast into the hearts. It's more like fear rather than terror. Anyway, and I have been given all the worlds. 
When I was asleep, I dreamt that the keys of the treasures of the earth were brought and placed in my hands. One variant has the prophets were sealed by me. So again, there's another feature of Islam is that Islam is just a dominant force in human history. It has been and continues to be. Uh, just this last Ramadan, we passed uh, to over 2 billion Muslims worldwide. And I mean, I don't know what the exact number is, but at some point in the not too distant you know, future, just from a basic statistical point of view, Islam will be the dominant faith on earth. It's just a fact. It's just always... Some people think, oh, mashallah, you know, yeah, but we also occupy the majority of the world's problems <laughs> with, with our mass numbers. So before we rejoice, we should also think about, well, you know, we have a lot of problems that we have to, to deal with. So it's just a fact of human history. Islam has always played that role. And that, by the way, is what, what has uh, fueled much hatred and animosity towards Islam, misinformation, uh, you know, people that have, have criticized Islam historically, spread lies about us, about the Prophet Islam. all of that comes comes from that, is that is that there's this sense that, man, you know, this, this, these people are just all over the place, they're, they're, it's, the, it's a dominant force. So this hadith is sort of like a foretelling of that. Aqba ibn Ayman reported that the Prophet Islam said, I will go ahead on your behalf and I will be a witness for you. By Allah, I am looking at the water basin even now. I have been given the keys to the treasures of the earth. By Allah, I do not fear that you will associate with Allah after me, but I fear that you will be content, that you will contend with each other for this world. So the Prophet, and I'm going to end with this hadith. The Prophet, وسلم, he said, what he fears the most for us is not that we're going to fall into disbelief, but that we are going to be obsessed with this world and this world alone. That we are going to compete for this world and this world alone. That's what he said he is most concerned for us. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa Allahu ta'ala a'la wa alam. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. What is meant by the keys to the treasures of this world? It's like the... It could be physical or material treasures, which would speak to the, um, you know, the glory of Islamic civilizations, uh, the architecture, the art, the, the literature, the economic dominance, or it could mean that uh, Islam or our, our deen has, has given us a way to benefit from all that is good in this world, such that it would lead us to the hereafter. Also that he says worlds, plural, not just this world, but all of the worlds. So the spiritual realms, the angelic realms, this world, the physical material world, that the Prophet Sallallahu way teaches us how to access all of that and benefit from it. So it could have multiple meanings. The Prophet Sazam was not educated in a way that he didn't go to school, but his manners, consideration for others, and other unlimited qualities who taught him all of this in his childhood. Well, there's a hadith. Uh, the Prophet Sazam said, Ad-Devani, Ad-Devani Rabbi wa ahsana ta'dibi, that the, the Allah Ta'ala has taught me and has perfected my education. Uh, so uh, he was guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from birth. Did the Prophet Sassam go to Sunday school? <laughs> the, the Prophet Sassam did not go to Sunday school, like our Sunday school, of course. Um, but he was sent uh, after birth to the Bedouin surrounding areas of Mecca to learn the, the pure Arabic language and the, the way of the, the pure way of the Arabs. Uh, I mean, Mecca at that time, 
I don't want to say it's like a cosmopolitan city that might be way overdoing it, but it was a city in which people were coming and going for trade purposes, pilgrimage purposes, etc. And uh, Quraysh is not the only Arab tribe. There were other Arab, main Arab tribes, but Quraysh is the tribe of the Prophet Salam, and the Quran was revealed in the language of Quraysh. The Prophet Salam was Qurashi, so it, it, his mother and wanted him to to adopt and learn that. So that was his, if you want to say schooling, that was sort of the closest that you get. Um, but the Prophet Salam did not need formal instruction the way we do because he receives revelation. So he re receives direct knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, 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 let me know if there are any other questions but, but before I forget my understanding is that there's no class next Friday for the long weekend is that correct I believe so so uh, no class next Friday is there a hadith of what khutbas the prophet gave Yes. Um, if you see that volume right there next to the red, next to this red volume right there, that thin volume there, that's a collection of all of the khutbas of the Prophet. So there were ulama in the past uh, that com compiled the Prophet's uh, khutb. You know, the Prophet came to Medina, and then um, let's say there were nine solid years in Medina, you know, nine times 52, that would be pretty much the, the major opportunities that the Prophet had to give uh, the khutbah. So there were ulama that compiled all of those in the past. This is a modern, a modern one. Revelation was after the prophet, prophethood, not in childhood. Yes, but the prophet Sassam was chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before he was even born. So even though he did not receive revelation until he was 40, from the time of his birth till the time of he was 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was protecting him, was allowing his circumstance to teach him. He gave him innate an, a, a nature and a disposition and character traits that were perfect. So the Prophet all of the Prophet is an example, not just when he became the Prophet until he passed, his entire life, even before he was, he received revelation. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Alhamdulillah. Um, as far as the timing for the class, I have no preference if it's 7 or 7.30. It's the same for me. Uh, I just, it's, it, you tell me what is good for the community. I know that the last like two or three classes, there was this issue of Maghrib. Um, my sense is that Maghrib is going to get later. So at some point, Maghrib will be past 8.30, I would assume. So I think we should go with what is best for the community. For me, they're the same. 7, 7.30, it doesn't make a difference. So it seems that not so many people showed up today. I don't know if that's just because people are tired of me, which is possible, or the time doesn't work, whatever. So whatever is good for the community, you let me know. Yeah, I think, I think uh, Imam Rifai said that the community preferred 7.30. Uh, we thought 7 because of Maghrib. So maybe we will revert to 7.30. 
Okay. I, I, my, I, if I remember correctly, we usually have this problem around this time because yeah. of Maghrib. And I know that uh, the over, my, my sense is that the overwhelming majority of people prefer the later time because yeah. it gives them an opportunity to come to the mosque or to, to log in because of work, school, that what, what not dinner. So I, I think that that makes sense. Okay. Um, Again, whatever is good for people. That's, that's fine. Good. So we'll we'll make it seven thirty, and then we can probably finish. So just before Maghrib, yeah. Yeah, and I think within a couple of weeks, two three weeks at the most, Maghrib will be closer to eight thirty. So we'll yeah. be okay, inshallah. Thank you so very much, uh, Imam, for my pleasure. being up at this time. My pleasure. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, there's an imam event today at ICM. Oh, many people are, oh, that's tonight. The imam event is tonight. It starts at 8. Ah, okay. I, I missed that. That's my fault. I saw the announcement, but I, I didn't register that it was tonight. Uh, okay. MashaAllah. Yeah, that, that, I'm very happy when I saw that, by the way, because, you know, we have several major centers in our area. When you think about it, um, at least three, you know, our mosque, ICM, uh, the Prince George's Mosque, and maybe there's a fourth. Uh, if you think about how many people worship at all of these mosques combined, it's quite a lot in our area. So I'm so happy. I was so happy to see that announcement uh, that Imam Rafai is going to represent us, alhamdulillah, and, and, and whatnot. I, I don't know, if, well, maybe you guys are not here with me tonight, but if the, I would love somebody to give me like a digest of, of what happens. Very curious to see how that goes. Alhamdulillah. So if there are no questions, uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and to bless our families. And, you know, may, may, may the secrets of this book be unlocked, you know, for us and may we implement, inshallah, all of what we learn. وآخر دعوانا من الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا مولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل أفضل صلاة على أسعد مخلوقاتك سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم عدد معلوماتك وميداد كلماتك كلما ذكرك الذاكرون وغفل عن ذكره الغافلون